All right, I guess my first question then is when, when uh, instantiating a class, implements versus extends. Uh-huh. Um, I can take that, or if somebody else wants to take it, that would be fine. Go for it. All right, so there were two different kinds of animals here. One of them is a class, and the other is an interface. And while they may look almost the same, um, there's a really, really big difference between them. So you can extend a class, but you can implement an interface. And I haven't yet gotten to what the difference between the two of them is, but let me I just... I can. Okay, go ahead. I have a good analogy. So good. to... Um, you implement an interface. Think of the inf interface as a blueprint. When you implement it, you actually make what it is you're trying to make, right? So you have an interface for a class called Orange, and you implement that um, interface into the um, implementation class Orange. You make the Orange object, right? Based upon that blueprint, which is the interface. Extends mean, let's say you have a class called Fruit, right? Fruit is a pretty generic class, and um, you want to extend it to be more um, detailed, right? To give it more um, refinement. So you would take a fruit and extend it to an orange, or extend it to an apple, or ex extend it to grapes. They're all fruits, but you're extending it, adding very specific properties to it that makes it um, still an um, still a fruit, but not an apple or a grape. Does that make sense? If you're making the orange class, does that analogy make sense? It makes perfect sense. Thank you, Shelley. I have I have I have another thing that I want to add to that is that there's a big difference between extending a class and implementing an interface in the following way. When you extend a class, you automatically get whatever the class already has in it. You inherit all the things that the class has in it. I'm being a little bit loose here because you don't inherit the private things, you don't inherit the constructors, but basically if the class de defines a, a, a variable, a default access variable or public variable or something like that, or a method or, a, or something like that, you, you just get it. Suddenly you have those things and you have the ability to work with those things. That's what it means to extend a class. On the other hand, when you implement an interface, it's like signing a contract. So the, the interface, unless you're talking about the most modern versions of Java, the interface really doesn't have anything in it that you get automatically. Instead, what the interface is, is a set of things that you, as the implementer, agree to provide bodies for. So for instance, the interface might have the header of a method, but with no body in it. You don't inherit that. You don't get it from the interface. Instead, if, if the interface says, I have a method called do something, and it takes an int value and returns an int, when you say, I'm going to implement that interface, what you're doing is you are promising to create a method with the same name and that takes an int and returns an int. So implementing an inter interface is more like agreeing to a contract. Extending a class is more like getting some stuff that's already been defined for free. And of course, there's the deal that you can only extend one class, but you can implement as many interfaces as you want. Okay, just triple checking. Um, number one, when you extend a class, basically Shelly Fruit would be the super class then? Like for fruit and orange? Sorry, yes, fruit would be the super class. And all of those uh, other like oranges and apples, they would inherit all the properties from a fruit, but they are not, um, they're not um, equal to the, um, the child, right? So they inherit some things from the parent, but they have their own properties that is, are very distinct from any child of the parent. Okay, and um, uh, Barry, 
if I understand it right, the interface is going to provide basically a blank function or method that has a return type and you have to override it to fill in the guts. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Technically everything that I'm saying is there are, there are loopholes here and there, but yeah, basically in the sort of gener general case, you have to, since the interface has the, de has the header for a method, you have to provide the body when you implement the interface. And if you don't provide the body, then um, the compiler catches you and says, wait a minute, you, you implemented this interface. You said, I promise that I will create a, a body for that method, for all the methods that you've got in it. So it's a sort of a different relationship than the, the, the relationship between a class and a super class is different from the relationship between a class and the class that it, the, the, the interface that it implements. I have a question. So um, when you implement an interface, is that why you're required to override certain uh, of the, um, what do you call them? <laughs> Methods. Methods, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. The, the idea, the idea there is, let's say I say I'm implementing the runnable interface. So there's a there's an interface in Java called runnable, and that means if I say I implement the runnable interface, that means I promise that I'm going to have the method that is declared with just a header in that interface. And the method in the, in the runnable interface is a method called run. I promise you that I have a run method. So that if you call me and say, you know, dot run, I promise that the, the program won't blow up because I do have a run, a run method. And, and the compiler checks that. So Barry, you wanna talk about why we create interfaces in Java? Um, I guess we don't allow uh, multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance came from the C++, well, it came, it came from somewhere, but it was available in the C++ language. And in the C++ language, you're allowed to inherit from more than one class. So you're allowed to extend um, class A and class B. And the problem with that then is that you can have conflicts. You can have, um, you, you can inherit from two different places and two different places have methods with the same names. And the question is, which one then do you, do you inherit? And that's a big problem. That's a big sticking point in the C++ language. So in Java, we want to extend only one class. Um, but then there's a problem then of having something with sort of multiple facets, multiple functionality, different kinds of things. Um, I can be, I'm thinking now in terms of Java because we're in a, in a, in a, in a um, Java um, discussion. Um, you can be um, an activity in the normal sense of the word um, activity in Android, um, but at the same time, you want to announce to the world that you can um, listen for certain kinds of events. So um, you can be an on-click listener. You can, in addition, to being an activity, you also want to announce to the world that you have the methods to listen for button clicks. So how do you kind of uh, balance those two needs? You say, well, I extend the activity class or the app compat activity class, so I am an activity, but hey, don't forget that if you want me to respond to button clicks, I implement the methods that are required to do so. So I not only extend activity, but in addition, I have certain other capabilities that I want to announce to the compiler are available. Like I do implement on click listener. I can 
have my have I do have an on click method. So if you call my on click method, the program won't explode. It won't crash because I do have that method. Um, does that kind of answer it, Shelley? Yeah, you were you answered the question like with the multiple inheritance and the conflict between um, uh, super uh, classes. Okay. That's exactly why. Okay. It's, I think yeah, it's I think it takes a lot of practice to get used to. Yeah, what I wanted to highlight was the difference between uh, inheritance and polymorphism. Okay, go ahead. No, you did. Oh. <laughs> All right, Scott, did you have other questions? Uh, several. I was just waiting to see if anybody cool. else had anything that was branching off of what we've already talked about. Yeah, let me just, let me just highlight that um, object-oriented programming concepts, um, including classes and interfaces, are very difficult for people to learn if you haven't been exposed to these things before. It is like riding a bicycle. Once you do understand it, you can't forget it. Um, so just stick with it. Scott? Uh, two. One of them is really fast, at least I hope. The assert keyword. I have right. absolutely no idea what this silly thing does other than maybe it, it sounds almost like you're double checking to make sure something is true or are you trying to force that it's true or what's going on here? Shelly, do you want to do that one? I have some experience with it, but not a lot. So an assertion is basically you declaring something to be, right? Either you're declaring it to be true, false, yes or no, whatever your assertion is, right? Think, I mean, it, think of it as just that. You're, you're making an, an assertion using the assert keyword. So what, um, What's inside, well, depends on which, which testing framework you're using, whether you're using um, just straight up JUnit or um, Makito or PowerMock, or you have the Hamcrest extensions, all of them, um, or even JAssert, all of them have some variation of an assertion. But basically, it's to test, um, test a theory. Think of it that way. You're making an assertion. So whatever, what's, what's, it's within those, um, with it, with it, whatever you pass to this assert method will either return true or false. Sorry about that. My phone's going nuts. That's okay. Did I answer that question for you, Scott? I think so. Um, the impression that I'm getting is that if you write a test that requires the orange to be on the floor, then before you begin the test, you assert the orange is on the floor to force Correct. it in the state? Correct. And then your test will either tell you whether the orange is on the floor or not, and that assertion will either pass or fail. Okay. And Shelly, the other, I, I'm ahead. sorry, Shelly, I, I, uh, I'm used to using JUnit and not the assert keyword from Java 4. Okay. Is this, is this different from your experience? No, actually, um, I use the, uh, the, uh, I use JUnit, I use um, Makito for just mocking. I use um, JAssert, which is, all, which is an extended, um, kind of an extension of JUnit um, that gives you some BDD um, formatting of your assertions, but I guess I don't understand what your question is. Oh, so there's an assert keyword in Java. And I think that's what's oh, okay. referring to. No, okay, yeah, I wasn't talking about the assert keyword. I was talking about the assertion method when you're testing. Oh, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about as well. So, I mean, Scott, have you heard of JUnit? I've heard the term. I know it's testing and what JUnit for, and that's about it. Okay, so the idea there, it, JUnit, as far as I know, is the most common testing framework for regular old desktop Java programs. And there are more elaborate ones for Android, especially. But the idea with most of them is you take an assert method call and you add it to your testing code. And you're saying, well, I think that if I call this method on this class, I'll get this result. And if you get that expected result, then the test says, 
green light. That's fine. Everything is good. Your test fit passed. Um, this code is um, reliable, at least when you feed in those inputs. If, on the other hand, you get a big red blotch on your screen, it says, no, what you expected to get from this method call to this class is wrong. So you create a test suite, which is essentially a, a whole separate program from your um, application that has a bunch of assert statements in it and says, tell me, um, am I getting the expected answer from this method call? Now am I getting the expected answer from this method call? So each of these asserts says, here's what I expect to get. If I don't get that, hey, something's wrong. I better start debugging this code. Okay. So basically you, um, you're asserting with the method calls when you're testing in order to create the situations that you need to test your code against? That yeah, roughly? yeah, yeah. And, and as far as I'm concerned, a successful test is one that fails. Yes. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the, 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 only, the only failed experiment is one from which you've learned nothing. So from, I'm talking from a TDD standpoint, your test will fail and your point, and you will write tests before you write code. So your test will always fail and you're always te to, um, chasing the next failed test, in my opinion. Because um, those failed tests gives you indication of what code you need to write next. But TDD is another topic altogether, sorry. Test-driven development. Yes. Goodness. We have to, we have to we have to shy away from using um, TLAs Acronym. without explaining them. Yeah. Three Acronym. three letter acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Scott, um, more questions or anybody? Um, one other thing I could add to the assert thing. It's kind of like a validate. Well, the this is the assert keyword. You can actually use it in functions inside your production code to like validate say if something needs to be a positive integer if you see something negative you can well you can assert that it's greater than zero which it'll fail the function and throw an exception so there's that it's less common to see that though i don't think i've ever seen that in production code there's there's that too okay. it's very similar to the the unit test version of it though yeah i've never used that assert um keyword Honestly, yeah, I don't use it either. <laughs> I, I don't use. It. We we write validation sub functions, um, and yeah. then actually throw uh, throw the exception we want to throw. So, yeah, exactly. That's probably a better use of it anyway. <laughs> Jurassic Park. You know, you could, but the question is, should everybody's got your video turned off? Um, is that I? Because you're recording. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. No, sorry. I was eating when we first started. Okay. All right. Yeah, I am going to post this on YouTube. Because of so, bandwidth. Um, more, well, you know, more interesting to watch if we turn our video on. Watch. Sorry, I'm in the shadows. It's all right. I, that's why I have a special <laughs> light here because I do have a, a thing behind me. Um, other questions, Scott, anything? Listeners, um, I am accustomed to something like, uh, I'm sorry if you hear noise in the background, that's the washing machine. Um, what I'm accustomed to is you attach code to a button that says on press, on click, on tap, and you call your function, your method directly. Uh, when that's interacted with. Now, I'm sure there's a listener there that is triggering that, but it's usually, it's in the background. I never have to set up a listener. So in Java, I'm sitting here looking at this, and I'm like, okay, I have to create a listener. What on earth am I doing? I have no idea how this thing works. I think that's more of an Android design issue than a, than a Java issue. Um, where, have, where have you, what environments have you used where you attach the code directly to the button or to the are you talking about flutter uh dart mostly dart and, and, and flutter is flutter. dart right uh well flutter's written in dart it's like saying that uh android would be java but not necessarily because you could use Kotlin. but yeah um i guess i'm so used to the notion of a listener because that 
is the way it works in desktop Java also. Um, so basically what you're doing is instead of putting the code that responds to button clicks inside the button class, you're putting it inside your activity class. And, and then you have uh, simply one method call that says button dot register listener this, where this is the activity that the, that the method call is in. Um, it's, it may seem a little bit more convoluted, but again, once you get used to it, um, you're just making the activity be the, be the class that contains the code for handling button clicks instead of the button itself. I'm not exactly sure. I haven't used the alternative that you're describing. Um, so I'm not sure what the advantages versus disadvantages versus why they do one versus the other. Anybody chime in on that? I mean, I'm not really worried about versus. I'm worried about being able to make it work. But anyway, that does apparently sound like a more of an SDK thing. Um, it's definitely an SDK thing and not, it's not inherent to Java. Okay. As far as I know. One that has always blown me uh, off into the weeds in every single language for some strange reason, and you're going to laugh, but to this day, I still end up with errors of you can't um, implement or access something from a static class. And so basically, I'll write my class off in a, in a different file, and then I'll try to use it, and it keeps telling me, no, you can't do that. So, I mean, how to actually utilize it um, when, when, in stand, when, when, uh, basically using a static class without um, creating an instance. So there's not such a thing as a static class. Are you talking about something that's static inside of a class? So, yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah, you can use static methods within um, a regular uh, object or instance object, methods on an instance object. You can't do it the other round, Scott. You can't use an instance or a object that has been since a method that has been that's on an object that has been instantiated within a static method so let's say you have a static method to um i don't know calculate the distance of something based upon two values and then you call a method within that static method that's not itself a static method that's where you're getting a, a violation so you can do it the other way around I'm tempted to make a drawing here, and I yeah, think, I think that um, might make, um, be better. Well, can, I think I can actually do that. So let me um, do a screen share. Um, where am I going to go here? Boom. Okay, can you see? Uh, yeah, can you see my my pad here and my this message from quiet, 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 quiet? My phone's making noise. Phone number two hundred. Can you see my, uh, can you see sort of whiteness here, my, my pad? Yep. Hello? Okay. All right. So, yes. um, all right. So, um, I'm trying to think of how to do this. Um, let's say, um, that I have. Um, a class, and I have, um, so this is class, and I'm going to call it A, and um, in it, I'm going to have a um, static int i, and then um, in it, I'm also going to have a method static void main. And so inside main, I say um, let i equal seven, something like that. Well, that's okay. And the reason that that's okay is because for any number of instances that you create for the class I, you have only, for, for the class A, you have 
only one eye because eye is static, and you have only one main because main is static. And so when you're saying i equals seven here, you're referring to that one and only one i. And if you create instances of this class, let's say you create seven or eight or nine or 10 different instances of this class, then you still have only one i because it's static and you still have only one main because it's static and everything is okay and everybody's happy. So no problem there, everything is good. On the other hand, you can get into trouble in the following way. Let's say that I create another variable, and just for simplicity, I'll call it an int, and call it n, and it's not static. And let's say that inside of static main, you try to say n equals nine. Then you're in big trouble. And the reason you're in trouble is because you have one and only one copy of main because it's static, but you don't have any copies of n yet. You haven't made any instances of the class A. So when you just write n here, you are um, trying to refer to an n that potentially will belong to an object creating, created from the A class but you haven't yet created any objects, and so you're gonna get a compile time error. And that's where I get into the most trouble when I, when I, when I bump heads against static versus non-static. It's a little hard to see something that I think is confusing it. When you're declaring the static int, the first one. Yeah. Um, that's just what, static int i semicolon? Yeah. Okay, so you're not actually instantiating it until you get into the main. Well, when you create static int i, what that means is that i lives whenever the class is being used at all. There's only one i. If you create six different objects from the class, there's still only one i. So um, if you haven't created any objects, there's an i. If you created 10 objects, there's one i. If you created 50 objects, there's only one i. So, so you're saying all these i's are equal or no? There's only one. No, I, I know, but if, if i equals seven, then and you have 50 objects of class A, every yeah. single i is going to be equal to seven? Exactly. And if, you, and, if, and, if, and if one of the objects changes the value of i, it changes the value of i for all the other objects. There's just one i, it lives apart from any objects, and if you change the value of i, it's all those objects know about the change. Right, because i actually uh, has a memory space on, uh, all on its own. It does, there's not multiple copies of i with the same ba um, value. There is only one i. And that's, um, with, and that's true with main also, because main right. is... Can you, can you show the other scenario where you have a method that is not static, but you're using a static method, uh, a static um, variable in within that one? Because that one works. If you have a method that's not static and you use a static, like an I with any method that's not static, you're still referring to that one and only, only one I. Okay, and just to liken what you just said to something else. I do 3D rendering and you create something called a material and the material is basically like a paint. So say it's, I color it blue. Now I duplicate this object all over the place and if I change the blue to orange, all of them are orange, correct? If you change a static in, no matter how many uh, instantiations of class A you have, eyes are going to have the same value no matter what and if you change one of them, they all change. Yeah, except the only thing I'm... Except there's only one I. Yeah, yeah there, there aren't multiple copies. Are. When you're saying they all change, there aren't they all to, to change. There's only one. Okay, so they, all the other class A's are just referring to the same I and the same memory location? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, Shelly, you said I should do another scenario, so let me do this. Let me do uh, void do okay. it and... And, vo and do it is not a static method, it's a regular old um, instance method. So in here, I'm allowed to say i equals seven. 
and or let me just change it. Let me just do something else here. Let me do i equals 17, just that I use another number. And I'm also allowed to say n equals 23. And both of those things work. And the reason that they both work is that this i equals 17 is referring to the i that belong, the one and only one i that belongs to the entire class. But the n equals 23, since n is not declared to be static, is referring to the singular n that belongs to whatever object this method is running in. Now remember, this void do it method is not declared to be static. So there are no copies of this void do it method until I create an object. And each object's void do it method will be using its own individual copy of the n variable because n is not declared to be static. So if I create an object, an instance of this class, then in one object, I can say n equals 23. And in another object, I can say n equals 42. And those are two separate n's and two separate sort of copies of the void method, of the void do it method. But each, in each of those, I will still be 17 because there's one and only one. Scott, how are we doing? Uh, getting there. Um, Tough. So basically, basically all the instances use an I, use a uh, use an I that is not actually in any of the instances. It's referred to because it's somewhere else. But all of the ends, each class has an N within it. Correct. Okay, and the void do it. I don't know what you mean by doesn't exist until it's instantiated until there's an instance, but. So um, that's important to the so, so 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 here's another diagram that I sometimes like to make, um, and this is I don't know not formally approved by the UML people, but it's one that I like to do. Here's a here's a class, and my class is called Card. It's called Playing Card, and that's a class, which means it just describes the things that a card has. Um, what does a card have? A card has a number, and a card has a suit, and it's just a class. So when I de define the card class, I just just by virtue of the class existing, um, I have not created any instances of it. There's just the concept of what it means to be a card. Every card has a number and a suit. So let me go ahead and create some instances of this. So I'm gonna create an instance whose number is two and whose suit is diamond. And so its number is two and its suit is diamond. Now I have actually have a number value and a suit value where I didn't have it up here. All I had was sort of the potential to have a number and a suit value. Let me create another instance of it. My other instance is gonna be n of hearts. So now I have two of them and eventually, you know, I'm going to have 52 of these. Um, no, not, not to interrupt you, but I think something just went off like the light bulb. Would the static yeah. variables of card... I'm getting to that. Uh, no, getting... no, I know. But would it be plastic coated? All the cards are plastic coated. Um, I let their value type thing. That, that yeah. is, that Yes, uh, what I was going to do, um, mm -hmm. similar to that, is a static, a method called <laughs> shuffle. Okay, right, a, a static method versus a static value. Yeah, and so the idea there is it doesn't make sense to, for each card to have its own shuffle method because a card can't doesn't shuffle itself. A card if you only have one card, you don't shuffle it. But there's sort of a global for the class notion of what it means to shuffle. So when you call, um, 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, so this is my card class, and I'm going to do um, card um, two of diamonds equals new card two and diamonds like that. And I'm abbreviating, but that's okay. We're friends here. So when I do that, I've created a brand new object. It has its own number. It has its own um, suit. And somewhere, if it has a display method, maybe there's a display method and it's not static. And at this point, I might say, and now I'm going to squeeze in here, two of diamonds dot display. And since the display method isn't static, the two of diamonds has its copy, its own display method that uses, in particular, the, the, the fact that it's a two and the fact that it's diamonds. But you don't want to say two of diamonds shuffle. Actually, technically you can, but you, it, it's, it's kind of silly to do so. Since shuffle is a static method, there's only one copy. It exists whenever the class exists. You don't have to create any object. And since there's only one copy, it belongs to all the cards collectively. So I can say card dot shuffle. And that shuffles all the cards. So when you have a method or a variable that's declared static, that means there's only one of them. It lives up here. When you have something that's non-static, then there are exactly as many as there are objects, and it sort of lives conceptually in each of the objects. So so how am I doing? Pretty good. So static things are only in the superclass then? They're only in the class itself. Superclass would be okay. if, if you extended it. Yeah. Superclass would be if instead of having just a card class, I had a playing object class, which could include cards or it could include little chess pieces or it could include, I don't know, dice or something like that. And card would be a kind of playing object. So uh, Barry, when yeah. you create, um, so if you have something that's static in the class and then you create instances of that class, yeah. the static thing, does it live in each instance of the class or no, just the class definition? I think of it as living in the class definition. Okay, that makes sense. So then in an instance of a class, you can still reference exactly. that. Yes. But it's static, so it's not going to change. It's just going to keep the value it has. It's, it's static so that when you change it anywhere in the code, it, it gets changes the one value. Everybody who references it. Okay. So, for instance, um, let's say, in, I just thought of something else here. Let's say that for card, there's a variable called um, manufacturer. And it's the name of the toy company or the company that makes this deck of cards. So in other words, that means that there's one and only one notion of who is the manufacturer for these 20 58, 52 cards that I have down here. And um, let's say the manufacturer is XYZ co toy company. So that means if this card wants to know when it displays itself, who to display as the manufacturer, 
it will reference this variable here and say, aha, that's XYZ Toy Company. And this card also will reference this variable up here and say, aha, I belong to XYZ Toy Company. Now, that analogy is cool, except I can't imagine a situation in which a card would want to change who its manufacturer is. But if any card did, if, if for some reason you didn't declare this variable to be final, for some perverse reason you didn't make this final, and the two of diamonds said, no, I don't belong to XYZ Toy Company anymore, I belong to ABC Toy Company now, then when the Ten of Hearts tried to reference its toy company name, it would also get the new name, ABC Manufacturer. Okay, that makes sense. So without static, it def it's the default, and each one will have their own reference, separate reference to that variable, right? Yes, exactly. Their own copy, I think of it, although probably technically it's not a copy. Okay. So I don't know if it's the intention of it to begin with, but at least a uh, side benefit of using static variables would be a smaller footprint for the overall application, wouldn't it? Because you've only got it in one memory location as opposed to, um, say, the number of the card. You need a memory location for each and every single instance. I suppose that makes a difference if you're planning on having um, a million different instances. But, um, well, it could make a difference if this variable up here is heavyweight. If it's not just an int, but it's a large, large object, a large class. Um, full of chock full of things and taking up a lot of memory. I suppose that would make a difference. If it's so, if it's final, then it makes sense to make it static because it's gonna. And you're if you're using that final thing in all your objects, then that would make sense, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Static final. Okay. Shelly, how am I doing? Mm. Is Shelly still here? We lost yeah. Her. Yep, she's there. I see her. Yeah. She's giving a thumbs up. Okay. Um, is it safe to say that uh, a static um, property is like a shared resource between multiple instances? Yeah, I think that makes sense. And just a segue into that was the um, the idea about final. I know in another language, something that's final does not have a uh, setter. Right. Because it's to reduce footprint. Same thing in Java, just it, you well, don't have a setter. It's, not, you it's, not so much, it's not so much to reduce footprint as it is to make sure that nobody accidentally changes the value of that variable. It's immutable. Yeah, I mean, you don't, if you, if you, um, what's, what's a good example here? Um, there, there are just variables. There are things that you want to assign names to, and you want to assign name to them for convenience, but you don't want anybody to ever change it, and that's when you'd make it be, be final. Like a read-only, basically. Yeah, exactly. I'd say the, first, the only example I could, well, not the only example, but one example I can think of is like, if you look at the integer class, there's a um, max value static final variable and yeah. a min value. Those will never change. The integer can only have a, a set uh, max. Yeah, and, and it's much easier to remember max underscore value than it is to remember whatever set of digits that is. Well, exactly. Like right now, I can't couldn't even tell you my brain isn't working yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the other thing, the other thing is besides being easier to remember, um, let's say that you did want to make a change to that value at some point. If you went ahead and typed that value several times in your code, then if you did want to make a change to that value universally, you'd have to find all the places in that code where that value had been typed, and that would be asking for trouble. On the other hand, if you put a, make create a name for that value and declare that name to be a final name, then you can put it everywhere in your code and on the 
on the rare occasion when you do want to change it, you have to change it only in one place. Okay, I'm going to go back to me on my, my face on the screen here. So what other questions have we got? Um, I have a quick question, Barry. So um, I'm going through your book right now. And uh, I'm not too far because I'm kind of focusing on the classwork, but as I can, I'm going through it. Um, I noticed that Varchar in Java can only store a character. Um, now I've seen like in a database, and maybe this is just- Wait a minute, Varchar. Sorry, uh, char. Maybe that's oh, my confusion. On. Is there, yeah, is there a diff? Like, is there such a thing as var, var car and car data types? Well, I'm only familiar with car as a, as a primitive type. C H A R. Okay, I think that's where my confusion is because they use C sharp at my company and it's probably a different type of data type and I confuse the two. So you kind of answered my question. Car is just a character, right? It's one. The weird thing is that car is actually an integer. It just happens uh, to be an, an integer with only enough memory to store a character. So okay. you, can, you can actually add, add one to a car and get the, the next car in the ASCII sequence. Oh, I see what you're it, saying. It, it really behaves a lot like an integer. Um, but when you, for instance, system out print it, um, which you never, never, ever, ever do that in Android. Um, <laughs> but um, you, um, it, it actually displays as a, a letter of the alphabet or a symbol or character or something like that. There's also, are you familiar with um, car versus character? Uh-uh. So each, so there are eight primitive types in Java and I can name them, but let me see. Um, <laughs> let's go. Um, int, um, Boolean, um, car, um, double, um, float, long, short, and byte. There are eight of them and they all are keywords and they're all lowercase. And they're primitive types, so you don't create an object when you declare a variable of that type. But each of those types has a wrapper type, which is a class, the name of a class that has a bunch of methods in it. So for instance, in addition to an int primitive type, which isn't a class type, there's an integer type. And an integer, when you create a new instance of the integer type, you get uh, stored in it one int value that you're not allowed to change. No, is it? Why in the world would you want to do that? <laughs> um, but, but, but let me pause for a minute just to, to emphasize that point. So there's an int type, which is primitive in the language, and there's an integer class, which is defined in java.lang. Like a helper class, like string? Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's a helper class. It's a way of putting an int into, a, into an object so that you can deal with it as an object. It also has methods like, um, I don't know. The integer has value of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of them are static methods. So for instance, um, parseInt is a static method. There's only one copy of it for the entire integer class. And what it does is it takes maybe a string and turns it into an actual int value for you. Okay, so. And, and, each, of, and each of the primitive types has one of these wrapper classes. When you, stay, when you say it's a static, um, did you say it's a static method? Yeah, parseInt is a static method. So, and so really that doesn't mean, I mean, you can use it and store multiple values, but that just means that there's one, there's one method for that helper class, right? Well, let, me, let, me just, let me just go back to sharing screen here because I think as soon as I, as soon as I feel myself moving my hands when I explain something, I know that I've got to 
got to go to. Okay, so let's see. Um, switch here. Um, all right, so I can create an int i equals 42. And that means conceptually, the way I think of it, I've got a variable named i and there's a 42 in it. Okay? Now then, I can do the following I can do integer. Um, and let me call it n, and that's going to be a new integer with a 42 in it. And so n is going to contain a reference to an object that has all kinds of methods in it and all kinds of stuff. But also, it's going to have a little slot there where it has the number 42 somewhere inside it. OK. Now, one of the things in here is parseint. Or actually, no. One of the things in the integer class is parseint, because parseint is static. So that means that I can say, for example, Please um, let a new int value called x be what I get from calling parse int on seven, the string 795. Now, this thing is a string. 795 is a string of characters. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it doesn't have any numerical properties. It's just the digit seven followed by the digit nine followed by five, just those letters, those characters. And so the parsint method takes this whole thing and turns it into a number like 795 that I can deposit in an int. Now, here's the deal. Parsint being static, it belongs to the entire integer class. There's only one copy of it. So when I refer to it, the best way to refer to it is by saying the name of the class followed by the name of the method. Because there's only one of them. It belongs to the whole class. In other words, you can't do n dot parse int. Well, guess what? There's a, loophole, there's a loophole in the language that says that n dot parse int is allowed it's you'll get a warning probably if you do it because it's a weird thing to do but and and it, and it's kind of bad practice yeah it 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 doesn't mean anything it doesn't mean anything specific to n but yes you are allowed to do that the other way the other way though you can't do um if you have a variable if you have a method Shelly, can you remember any methods that are that are um, not static in the integer class? She's that might be her coughing. I know she had. I know she coughs sometimes with different things. Not off the top of my head, no. All right. So let's say I have a method in the integer class called I don't know do or no do isn't is, is a bad name. I have a method in the integer class called. Um, my whatever it is and it's not static so non-static method in the integer class that means there's a copy of my for every single integer object that i create so then it is certainly legal for me to call n's copy of the my method that's absolutely uh, fine hmm. but if you were to say integer dot my the compiler would say i'm sorry i'm not going to compile this code <laughs> because you're trying to refer to the my method that there's a different one for each object and you're not naming an object in particular you're naming the entire class 
So uh, a couple examples that are not um, static would be the compare to and the equals. Okay. Right, right, right. Equals and compare to. Uh, two string is another one that will, well, cool. obviously, print right. integer 42 is let's the string 42. So let's do, um, let's do um, um, two string. Um, so I can say um, n dot two string, that makes sense. Because n being an object has its two string method. But if I say integer dot two string, the class itself doesn't have a two string method because the two string method isn't static. How many copies are there of a particular variable? If you focus on that and just keep remembering, I've got one copy for each object or I've got one copy for the entire class. Um, eventually, it makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. Am I going? Am, am I uh, going off in the left field, or am I looking at it correctly that the static methods are a lot of what they're going for in functional programming? So that no matter how many times you run it, if you put in the same input, you always get out the same output. I don't think so. Left field's got it. <laughs> functional, functional is um, no mutable, no mutable variables. Um, referential transparency, um, and in in pure functional programming, there's no notion of objects um, versus classes. So. I'm not familiar with the hybrid um, languages. Um, I, I think it's real. I think it's a different issue. Questions or anything else? Scott, did you have a long list, or are we near the end of your list? I've got one left. If nobody else has anything. Okay. I do have one. Okay. But it's more, it's related to the um, Gradle build system. Anybody has any idea how to make it run faster? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I use Maven at work and it, I just, I cringe every time I do a build in Android. Yeah, it's very slow. I guess I'm uh, glad to hear that that's normal then. <laughs> is it is it a lot slower because all the like Android resources, it's like having to draw everything and what is it about it you think? <laughs> it, I could take a, a microservice that is written in Java and build it in Maven and build it in Gradle and Gradle's just slow and I can't explain why. Is there well, any way to swap Gradle out? and like kind of Jimmy rig it so it works or? <laughs> I've got a bunch of stuff that it keeps nagging me that I should change it to Gradle. And whenever I try it becomes this convoluted mess. So I just don't bother. And, uh, but I do have some other stuff that was created in Gradle and yeah, there's a big difference, really big difference. It is a very long development cycle between between writing and, and running. Um, they do, do, do um, one thing I noticed about Gradle is that it has to be attached to the network and, or it seems that it has to be attached to the network every time it, it, um, it rebuilds. Is that true with the other frameworks? With Maven, no. Uh, well, okay, so to answer that question, there's two parts. If you already have the dependencies that you, um, that your project is using, download it locally, then it will not refresh the dependencies. If you add a new dependency, it will go back to whatever your Maven repository is and get the um, new dependency. Gradle does something interesting. I don't know if it automatically uh, refreshes all of the dependencies every build, but I know it checks for the Gradle, de um, 
distribution if you're using a great old wrapper, which if it, um, when it does that, whatever you have in the gradle.property file as the distribution you're building for, if that is not on your machine or it can't locate it at that moment for whatever reason, it goes and tries to download gradle distribution again. And that's when you need to be on the network. So obviously it needs to download it from somewhere. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It, uh, but I, even when you have all that download, it's just still slow. Yeah. I just don't get it. Hmm. How, much, how much RAM do you have, Shelly? I actually bought a Surface Book um, 2. So I think this one has 16 gigs of RAM on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not my machine. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Really not my machine. The, the, the one thing I noticed, um, and I don't know if this is still true because I have a hefty amount of RAM right now, but um, the emulator is um, really problematic unless you have, say, 16 gig. Yeah. Yeah. I run multiple copies of the emulator plus share my screen with no problem. So that's, that's not the issue. The issue really is Gradle, for example. And I probably need to read more up on it. Like, for example, I just built this one project, simple project, just has one main activity. It took two minutes just to do the first build. Two minutes. Wow. I'm, having, I'm having a similar sort of problem with IntelliJ IDEA right now because I'm using it um, in a course with students just to teach JavaScript. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it's um, particularly sluggish when I open a new project or, st or start it up. Um, but, okay, so if you're only doing JavaScript programming in IntelliJ, then you yeah. might want to look at what plugins you're, you have enabled and disable plugins you just simply don't need. There's a, a list or, or a group of plugins that by default IntelliJ will enable. Okay. You get most of them, if you are just doing um, uh, JavaScript programming, like and I know. Okay, so I know that I've got a Haskell program, a Haskell plug in there that IntelliJ mm -hmm. is complaining about. What yeah. I think I hear you saying is disable it. Yeah. Get rid if of you're it. not using it, disable it. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that's good advice. I'm using, I'm using uh, uh, the library. Uh, just yesterday, I downloaded it, but it was from Maven. And you can add Maven Central to the build Gradle mm -hmm. and use the Maven repository and download it instead of the Gradle repository. You can, but it still uses Gradle to build. And I don't know, I don't know, really, I honestly don't know why Gradle is slow. I haven't figured it out, but it is definitely slower. I use a um, framework at work called Spring. That's very common in the industry. You probably, guys have probably heard of it. So I write um, microservices using Spring Boot. And a lot of Spring's uh, documentation and examples are on Git and or GitHub, and, and they use Gradle as well. And I can literally take the exact same example, convert it over to a Maven project, um, and build it in Maven, and it's like a fraction of the time. Like within seconds, I can build a Maven where it takes minutes. The first build, now if I build the same thing in like this project I just built that took two minutes, I can stop it and build it again, and it won't take two minutes. So, I don't know what it is about the first build, um, but what kind of, what kind of uh, processor do you have? In the in this machine, hmm, it's an i seven. It's the next last. It's the um, generation eight. So it's uh, like eight six five zero. Is the yeah. It might be the 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 um, the SDK version that you have. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I sincerely think it's just Gradle because I can do it on different machines with different SDKs and they just it's just slower than um, Maven. Just way slower than Maven. Like I can do it on my work machine, which also has 16 gigs of memory. Um, but I think that one is an i5. Um, but still, just slower. Because I'm running on a Mac Mini with a Core Duo, uh, uh, yeah, Core Two Duo, whatever, 16 gigs of RAM, and it's mm -hmm. running fine. Running Maybe fine, what you're running, used to. Yeah, yeah then, running fine running versus fast. running slow is different. Like, so it, it, it's just slow. It's not not running, but it's it's slow. You know, the yes. first bill is always slow. I'm I'm new to Java, so I'm ignorant. So I thought that's just how it's supposed to be. <laughs> that's certainly not. It's certainly 
Gradle isn't used universally with all Java code. So yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, I think Maven is more widely used still. Hmm. But Maven is very complicated from what I understand. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what, what complicates Maven is the, um, if, when you guys see like the gradle.property file or the build.gradle file, that language in there that expresses like your dependencies and you know how to build, that's Groovy, right? Gro they, um, gradle uses Groovy as a, a domain specific uh, language for, um, in their build tool. Maven use XML and definitely, I find um, I find Groovy a lot more a uh, lot more approachable than XML. Although I'm comfortable with XML, I, I'm just not a fan at all. I've never been so. I think that's what uh, kind of scares people when they look at a Maven Palm file. They open it and they're like, "Oh my God, what's going on?" <laughs> But there are tools that help with that. Like if you're using Eclipse, they have an IDE that abstracts away the XML and you simply fill out the forms in the IDE and don't have to worry about the, um, the XML at all. But that IDE itself, I think it's sluggish. I'm not a fan of Ex Eclipse either, so sorry. Scott, you had another Java question. Uh, it's basically more a programming question, period. Okay. Um, abstract keyword. Now, my basic understanding of it is that an abstract class is kind of like the way an interface was described, as in it's a, it's a rough framework that you got. It's, it's kind of like walking into a house where all of the rough uh, – all of the rough carpentry is done. You have studs up and there's, you know, the outside of the house is up, the siding is up, the roof is up, but you walk in and there's no carpet, there's no drywall, and you have to do more with it before you can use it. Is that correct or again? Sounds my good. Life? I like that. Yeah. An abstract class is, is definitely a class in that you extend it, but it's a little bit like an interface in that you can't use it until you supply bodies for some of the methods in it, the ones that are declared abstract. It, and also, if I, could, if I can add to it, it's also because you can only inherit from one class, but implement as many interfaces as you want. So you have that base class that you inherit from and that's like your, your house, like you mentioned, and you can implement as many interfaces as you want that define the behavior of whatever object you're working on. Is that correct? I'm sorry, that I, that, I, I thought you were making a statement and no. No, 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 I mean, I, I, I'm, am I like, is that an accurate assessment? I want to say that again because I was, you know, so you can only, since you can only inherit from one class? Yeah. The abstract class is like your foundation, right? Yeah. And so that you can add as many interfaces that will change the behavior of your foundation, basically. I, I think of interfaces as not changing the behavior so much as enhancing the behavior, adding to the behavior. Um, but definitely you can only you can only extend one abstract class. You can only extend one class, be it abstract or not. Um, I don't see a lot of abstract classes in Android. Um, I don't see as many, I don't see as many abstract classes. I definitely, definitely interfaces are much, are used much more. Um, what would an example be for using an abstract class? I think you use an abstract class when you um, don't want to, when you want to supply bodies for some of the methods and not all of them. Um, yeah. Okay. And 
I can't think of any examples in the Java API. I can. So okay. let's say you have a REST controller. So you would create, you know, a base REST, REST controller that um, maybe, you know, define a method for, I don't know, oh, for how to handle the, you know, HTTP not found uh, exception, right? So just a base, a base um, method for how to handle that. Then you, um, sorry, then you extend that base controller because your API might have multiple controllers in it, which is, eh, okay, but your API may have multiple controllers in it, but they all use the same type of, uh, uh, they all handle exceptions the same way. That might be, that's kind of a weird way, of, but that might be a way of using a base or abstract class. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. It's not something that I've ever felt compelled to create except as examples of how it works. Yeah, pretty much. And are there, Shelley, do you recall any of them that are actually specific to Android? No, not at all. I'm, I'm fairly new to Android, so, but so far, no. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> I, obviously I've, I've noticed that we're overriding a lot of stuff and in your, towards the beginning of your book, you kind of talk about um, building a house and if you want to put a jacuzzi, you know, in the, in the middle of the living room, uh, you would, obviously you have the main class for your house and then you can extend, um, to add rooms, but then you can like override to add like certain customization. So that's basically what we're doing, right? When we're overriding. Yeah. You're saying uh, I would normally inherit this method. Yeah. And I want most of the methods. I want a lot of the methods that are already in the class. I want to extend the class. I want to get the benefits from that. But I don't particularly like the way the parent class does this thing. And so I want to change that. I want to make a change to it. So I do an override. Um, okay. And I, and I use the at override annotation mm -hmm. in order to remind the compiler that I'm trying to override existing functionality. I don't need to use add override, but it's much safer if I do that. Okay. So like with uh, um, on create, for example, um, that's one I've noticed that we override sometimes. So, so when we're overriding that, where is the on create um, exactly coming from? Is that being imported from one of the Android um, objects? It's being imported from whatever class I'm extending. So if I'm extending app compat activity. App compat activity, that's okay. Where it's, that's where it's, that's where oh, it's. Oh, okay. So same goes with all the life cycle stuff. Yep. Um, okay, and then when we're overriding it, um, is there is there a way to look at the original? Oh sure. Method? Like without, I mean, I know we could Google it, but in the IDE itself. Um, control click app compact activity. It'll uh -huh. you can, it'll take you inside that class. Control click any class, and it yep. will take you to its declaration. Ah, okay. So you, if you control, you'll see there is a method for on. Um, on uh, create and it does stuff right so when we're overriding it we're we're saying we don't want to do that stuff we want to do something else right um well actually okay. we're saying we want to do both well, well it depends that, on if you call question. super right that's yeah that's where super comes into play yeah okay, it, only if you're calling the super oh okay so if you have an on button press and it opens the car door and then you override on button press and you tell it to open the hood did you just lose the functionality to open the door along with that or using super somehow keeps the door and adds the hood? So that depends. Yeah. 
So if you call the super of the, of the in class that you're extending, then you will still open the door and do whatever else you tell it to do. Oh. You don't call the super, super, super thing. You're, not, you're overriding it. You're telling it to do something else. Except, oh. there's one, except there's one little loophole that threw me way off the track when I started Java. Let's say that the method that you're overriding is parameterless. Um, Shelly, make sure that I get this right. No, I guess I, that, no, that's for, that's for constructors. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, so Shelly's right. Yes. This, this might be a silly question, but what I if like you, those. those are the ones we can answer. <laughs> what if you override it and start typing code and then you call super after, then you do whatever you typed first and then you inherit everything else after? So if we were to open the door and open the hood, well, then I flip everything around. Are we going to open the hood, then open the door? I think yeah. so, yeah. Okay. Because the, the idea is you're overriding the functionality. Calling super or saying, I also want to do what the parent class did, right? So in what okay. order you do that depends on where, in what order you call super. But we probably call super a lot first because a lot of the things we're doing is depending on what happens in super that's already... yeah. right that's okay. i see that more common commonly yes i see where if you're going to call the super of a class you're going to call that person then extend that by doing something else yeah the rules are a little bit comp more complicated when you're overriding a constructor um but this is not the time to get into that just warning if you're overriding constructors you got to you got to mind your p's and q's. You got to you've you've got to you've got to watch out for what it is that the super keyword is doing and where you're putting it. So just okay, yeah. I'll keep that in mind for yeah. down the line. Okay, anything so, else? In a nutshell, using the word super allows the method to, for all intents and purposes, have inheritance. And without the super, you lose the inheritance. No, you get the in, it, of, it, it, it allows it allows it sort of allows the method. I, I know what you're I know what you're saying with inheritance. Yeah, yeah it, it's kind of yeah. I can super that super adds so, functionality. Yeah. No, I can explain that. So you're inheriting everything, let's take app compat activity does by extending it, right? By overriding, you're telling you're replacing what the default behavior is. By adding super, you're saying, wait a minute, I still want that piece of the default behavior in my code, right? So override just overrides what the default does. By including that super statement, you're bringing that super back in, but you've already inherited everything on um, compact activity does. Public stuff. Let me first make Thanks. So within onCreate, you do like super dot onCreate. So you're basically saying su replace super with the parent, right? Whatever that is. And yeah. then yeah. dot the onCreate. parent's onCreate method. Yeah, you know what would be awesome, guys, if you take just that method right there on create and put a breakpoint um, in the method and see what happens when you call um, on create, like what steps it actually takes in what order. Then flip it, right? Flip those those two the two lines that you generally get when you create a project. You have um, on create and then set um, content view, right? It might fail when you do set content view because there's stuff that's happening in on create and the super on create that you need to have happen first. Don't know, but try that and you'll you'll see what in what order things happen. Now, have you ever Wait. actually tried that? Because I think Android won't let you compile if you don't put super in the right place. Let's see. It's um, like the what is it? The own options item selected when you're doing like menus. The super is actually the last statement there. So you're overriding each implementation that you want, but then you're passing it up to the super class if you don't want to implement yeah. anything. I don't yeah. think it does anything, but it might. I haven't looked at the code for it, so I'm not entirely positive. But So I'm trying that right now. I got a breakpoint on the set content view, but I moved um, super.onCreate. Right, we'll let you do it. It's so if we see it. smoke in Shelly's room, then we know it doesn't work. It, it did it. 
Yeah, it did it and it stopped. Yeah. In fact, can I share my screen? I'll show you. Okay. Um, so when you say breakpoint, are, is it just a way to step through the code line by line or is that yes. just a function of the IDE? Yes, that's a function of most modern IDEs is to be able to